shall we close our eyes for prayer? Our God, our Father, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you because you brought us together for a good thing. And we pray that the purpose you have in heart for gathering us together to worship will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you put upon us the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, and of worship today in Jesus' name. That our hearts, O oh Lord, will be drawn unto you, and we will be closer, nearer to you in fellowship and in grace in Jesus' name. Bless your people here today. In Jesus' name we pray. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, we're looking at verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We're talking about something very important, very essential, eternally important, eternally essential. The salvation that Christ came to give unto us. I'm talking to you on great salvation from Christ. Great salvation from Christ. And here the Apostle Peter when he was questioned by the religious people of the day, he told them in verse 11, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. These religious people established religion for the midst of Christ. It's like they built a building, but no foundation. They have this mighty building of religion for the cornerstone that will make that religion worthwhile was not there. And so Peter told them, this is the stone, the cornerstone, the essential stone, the stone that brings stability to the building that has been neglected of you builders set at north by you the builders, which is become the edge of the corner. And then he emphasized to them, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name. There is no other personality. There is no other founder of religion that can establish anything that will link anyone to the Lord with saving value. There's no other, there's no salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, either in the past, or in the present, or in the future, whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 5, verse 31, him referring to Jesus, he must go exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. There may be people that exalt themselves, and they refer to themselves as Savior, but the Lord has not appointed them. There may be religious people, religious leaders, of different persuasions, of different doctrines, of different traditions, either in the East or in the West, or in the tropics, I mean either in Asia or in Europe or in Africa, or in China, anywhere, there may be people that exalt themselves as founders of great religion, and they say they are the saviors of the people, but Christ, as God himself, exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. That great salvation had been given by the Lord Jesus Christ because the Father had so appointed him. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Since Christ is the only Savior, and since the salvation he has brought is the only salvation that can reconcile us to the Heavenly Father, how then shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, how shall we escape the judgment of God? 
How shall we escape the wrath to come? How shall we escape the indignation, eternal punishment, coming as a result of our sin? Except we accept, we receive, we embrace their salvation given by the Lord. How shall we escape the fury of the Lord and the fierce anger of the Lord if we neglect so great salvation? Pick up that word, neglect. There are times you are not outrightly rejecting something, but are just neglecting it. There are times you are not outrightly refusing something and throwing it away. Maybe you are not even saying, I don't believe in Christ. Maybe you are saying, yes, I believe it's true. But you have not got it. You have not sought it. You have not received it. And you have not run to the Lord saying, Oh Lord, I need this salvation from the Lord. You are still holding back in your sin. And you are not yielding yourself, surrendering yourself, and you are not dedicating, devoting yourself to the Lord. You are neglecting, although you are not rejecting. If you are coming to a church like this, obviously you are not rejecting the Bible, but you may be neglecting it. You are not rejecting salvation, you may be neglecting it. You are not refusing the way of salvation, you may be neglecting it. Maybe you are even talking to other people, salvation is very important, but you have not got it. And you are saying, by and by, when I finish this, when I've done this, when I've achieved this, when I've done this other thing, then I will get saved. You may not be rejecting it, you are neglecting it. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And sometimes you find some people, especially those who are young, they say no time for salvation now, no time for a change of life now. I will go to school. After that, what else? I will graduate. After that, what else? I will start working. What else? I'll build a house. What else? I'll get married. What else? I will have children. What else? I will be satisfied. After that, I can think about salvation. You know it is true. You know there is salvation. And you know except him and be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But you are neglecting that salvation. And if you neglect, you keep on neglecting, you don't know the day that the Lord will call you home. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that study. Their salvation is not a sweet thing. And sometimes you have been in an orthodox church, a traditional church, an African church, an indigenous church, and you have been hearing about ceremonies and rituals and traditional worship, but never about salvation. When you come to a place like this and you are hearing about salvation, you must be born again. Then you say, but this is new. This is strange. Then you say, oh yes, I've heard there are some people, they said, they are young, young people, and they talk about salvation. And you think that salvation is a new thing. Salvation is uh, something we just started, deeper life started, and it started talking about salvation. I've been going to church all my life, I never heard there's something they call salvation. Look at this. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord. It's the Lord that started it. And the Lord spoke about it, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord himself. It is not a modern day salvation. It is not a new day salvation. It is not a new doctrine we just brought up about salvation. The Lord himself, Jesus Christ himself, our Redeemer, our Lord, our Savior, he began to speak about the salvation. And then he says, I was confirmed unto us 
by them that heard him. It was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Number one, Jesus Christ spoke about it. The apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ confirmed it. Verse 4, God also bearing witness, God also affirming and confirming that that word of salvation is real. That that word of salvation is necessary. That except a man be reconciled with God, except his sins be taken away, except his washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, he will not see the face of God. He must be saved. He must be born again. God also bearing them witness with signs, but with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was even involved. The gifts of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost supplied the gifts. Jesus Christ spoke about it. Salvation from sin. God Almighty confirmed it. Salvation from sin. And the Holy Ghost gave the gifts to the apostles to declare it and to defend it and to call people to decision so that they can be saved, they can be born again by the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Trinity joining together and impacting and empowering the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ to speak about their salvation essential, indispensable, non-negotiable salvation. Before you can see the Lord, how important then it is. And yet, there are people that neglect. I pray you will not neglect it. And the salvation of the Lord will be yours in Jesus' name. Great salvation from Christ. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, decision on the invitation to the great salvation. Decision on invitation to the great salvation. The Lord is inviting you. There's something called great salvation. And when you have that salvation, it will lift you up with the Lord. It will reconcile you with the Lord. It will bring you to fellowship with the Lord. You are invited. Come. Come unto me. All you that labor. And a heavy lady, and I will give you rest, I'll give you salvation. Decision on invitation to the great salvation. Number two, the danger of indifference to the great salvation. The danger of indifference to the great salvation. When we say you are indifferent to something, it means that you are to see you are neutral. You are not against it, but you are not for it. You are not eager to get it, but you are not adamantly rejecting it. You are not possessing it, but you are not saying it does not exist. You are just indifferent. It's like it means nothing to you. And that's a dangerous thing, a danger of indifference to the great salvation. Number three, divine intervention through the great Savior. Divine intervention through the great Savior. I come to number one, decision on invitation to the great salvation. In Second Corinthians chapter 6, Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation, advise succor thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, this very time is the day of salvation. If you have been coming for a long time, or you are just coming in today, and you have not received the Lord as your personal Savior, taking you out of sin and coming into the righteousness of the Lord. And there is no change, dramatic change, a total change, a complete change, a complete turning around in your life. This is the day 
How will you be coming for so long and there's no change in your life? How will you be coming for so long and there's no salvation in your soul? How will you be coming for so long and you don't have the witness of the Spirit of God that you are born again? What if you died today? Where will you spend eternity? It's not just to come to church. It's to receive the salvation of the Lord. The reason Jesus came into this world is to save. Is to forgive your sin. Is to change your life. Luke chapter 19 verse 10. Luke 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the reason he came. That's the purpose for which he came. And if you have not been saved, if your sins have not been taken away, if you have not been redeemed, cleansed, totally transformed, so that you are not sinning anymore, you have not accepted the purpose for which Christ came. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's why he came. He came to save from sin. And if you have not received that salvation, you are neglecting so great salvation. Why is it so great? Because it was planned by the great God. Why is it so great? It was offered by a great Savior. Why is it so great? Because it comes with great grace. Why is it so great? Because the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. It makes you great in the sight of the Lord when you receive that salvation. It promotes you from earth to heaven. It reconciles you with the Lord. So great salvation. And how will you escape the judgment of God if you neglect that great salvation? The decision that you ought to have, as you are invited to have, to receive and to possess this great salvation. Decision on the invitation. In Acts chapter 13, Acts chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 26. Acts 13, 26, men and brethren, the children, children of the stock of Abraham, whosoever among you feareth God, to you is this word of salvation said. You have an invitation, come. You have an invitation, be born again. You have an invitation, have a change of life. Have the grace of God and the salvation of Christ come into your life. To you is the word of this salvation sent. And as the invitation comes to you, you need to decide immediately. I just told you that uh, you may be there that you are coming to the church for such a long time. And you have not been born again. And to you maybe that is not strange. Because you say, yes, I'll get born again. It's not too late yet, because I only came, I've only been here for six months. I've only been here for two years. Would you realize that the people that came to the Lord, the very time, the very moment they came to the Lord, that they had the word of the Lord, they got saved? Here was Peter, Simon Peter. He was by the seaside, and he threw his net into the sea, and he caught a multitude of fish. And then he said, oh Lord, I am a sinner, a great sinner. Depart from me. And the Lord said, Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He made me. God saved. Not second day. Not third day. He did not neglect. Here is Matthew. And Matthew was just by the side of the road. And Jesus got to him there. And then Jesus said, Follow me. He left everything. He got saved. And here is Zacchaeus. Jesus came to town. And when Jesus came to town, he wanted to see who Jesus was. He went up the top of a tree. When Jesus got there, he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I must abide in thy house today. He got saved that same day. That same day. Today, salvation entered into this house. How oh, you see that all these people met the Lord? And the very day they met the Lord, that's the day they got saved. 
there are many thousands of people listening to Peter on the day of Pentecost. And then he said, men and brethren, these men are not drunk as, as you think they are drunk. There's the Holy Ghost that Joel prophesied about. And then he said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent, turn away from your sin. 3,000 of them, they got saved the very day they had the message of the gospel. I see it, you are neglecting six months, one year, one and a half years, three years you are there, and you are still smoking. Many years you are there, you are still drinking. Many years you are there, there's no change in your life. The hanky-panky of the past, the fraudulent business of the past is still in your life. And the old life is still there. But all these people, the moment they came to hear the word of the Lord, they gave their lives to the Lord, they decided, yes, in the day of your decision, you will decide today. I said you will decide today. Acts chapter 9, verse 29. Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran to the dream, and had him reach the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and seek with him. Here we have the eunuch of Ethiopia. He was reading the word of God. He had a desire. He had a passion with him. He had a righteous pursuit with him. He wanted to know the Lord. He didn't know the Lord yet. He wasn't born again yet. He didn't have the salvation of the Lord yet. So great salvation. He was searching. He was searching. Maybe you are there. You are being another religion. And every time you're sitting on the ground and you're praying, you're saying, God, show me the way. God, show me the way. God, show me the way. And now you came here today. The Lord wants to answer your prayer. And He's showing you the only way of salvation. And the moment you're here, that's the moment you ought to respond and get saved. Maybe you're a backslider. And then you recently had a dream. And that dream terrified you. And when you woke up in the morning, the Lord told you, you are a backslider. That dream that you urge, I have and in it. If you don't repent, calamity is coming your way. And then you are here today. Why don't you then today surrender and know that what you are hearing is not accidental. Here we are told this man searching the word of God, reading the word of God. And then Philip came near, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And the man said, How can I understand, except some man should guide me? Come over here. And then he joined him in the chariot. And he sat with him, the statue, the place of the scripture, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? of himself or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip opened his mouth and preached unto him Jesus. Jesus as Savior. Jesus as a friend of sinners. Jesus is the one that has come to bring us away from our sins unto the Holy God. Jesus who gave his life and sacrificed his life so that we may be saved. He preached unto him Jesus. He wanted him to be reconciled unto God. He wanted him to know that Jesus Christ 
Christ's death on the cross of Calvary will take away all his sins and then he'll become saved, born again, righteous in the Lord. And so he preached unto him, Jesus, and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water, what does it that mean to be baptized? The man had been saved. And he was requesting now to baptize in water. Not that Philip was forcing him, putting pressure on him. They baptized in water, and then there are the argument. But I'm coming from Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, all those Pharisees, all, they already baptized me. And they have already initiated me into the Jewish religion. No argument at all. He himself, because of definite salvation, he himself was now after Philip and saying, Here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized in water? And then Philip said, Look at the next verse in verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, if it's not a partial faith, if it's not a temporary faith, if it is not an emotional faith, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you know there are people that have partial faith, they say, yes, I believe in Christ, but you also believe in your idol. I believe in Christ, you also believe in your legitimacy. I believe in Christ, you also believe in traditional religion. I believe in Christ, but you believe, you also believe in candle and incense. I believe in Christ, but you also believe in angels. Not a partial faith. If you believe with all your heart, not a partial faith, not a temporary faith. A faith that will say to the okay, I rest of my hand, I believe in Jesus. And then tomorrow, you have come back with your old lifestyle. Temporary. Like the dew of the morning that passes away at noonday. But you say, with all my heart, today and tomorrow, and for the rest of my life, Christ is, and Christ only will be my Redeemer and my Savior. He lives such, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, my Savior, my only Savior. And they were told in verse 38, and he commanded the channel to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. He immersed him. He dipped him inside the water. If the baptism was only to sprinkle water on him, he didn't need to go into the river. They could send any of the servants there, go down there and bring a, a cup of water there a bowl of water there and give it to Philip and sprinkle him. But you see, they came out of the chariot and they went into the river and he dipped him, he must him in the river. That's the baptism. He baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the, 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 the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Why? Oh, salvation brings joy. There's a special joy that salvation brings. There is a deep joy that salvation brings. There is a kind of unspeakable joy that salvation brings. There is a kind of non-transferable joy. I cannot transfer it to you. That man that has salvation cannot transfer that kind of joy to the wife. The wife will not understand. It's not transferable. And the wife that has salvation, there is a kind of joy that you have. You cannot transfer to your husband. There's a kind of joy that a child has, the joy of salvation that that child cannot transfer to the parents the joy of salvation. When you actually get born again, that joy you'll find in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm reading to you from verse 12. Respond to me. The joy of that salvation. You see, David, he had that salvation before. 
but he must sleep. That's why he prayed in Psalm 51. Although he was still king, the joy of position is not to be compared with the joy of salvation. Although he was still rich, the joy of having wealth is not to be compared with the joy of salvation. And although he had children, the joy of having children cannot be compared with the joy of having salvation. And although he had many servants, the joy of being a master controlling many servants cannot be compared in any way for the joy of salvation. And he was number one in the nation of Israel. The joy of being a political leader cannot be compared with the joy of salvation. That's why David, with all the other things they had, because he knew he had lost the joy of salvation. He said, now, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. You see that these people were talking about, as they had the word of the Lord, it was that time, that day, they decided decision or invitation to the great salvation. Acts chapter 16. I'm reading from Bostachi. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thine house. Not partial faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the Lordship of Christ. He will become your Lord. Not that he will be your Lord and then there will be another thing that will be your Lord, partial. Not that he will be your Lord today and then tomorrow you go back and be the Lord of yourself, temporary. But believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be the Lord of your life. The Lord of your life, totally, completely, and forever. Not partial, not temporary, but he will be the Lord of your life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thine house. And they speak unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Do you understand that? Look up here, please. Uh, you need to understand these men, that is Paul and Silas, they had been beaten. And because they were beaten, they were bleeding in their body. And they were thrown into the prison. And they told this Philippian jailer, keep them very well and come back to this place. Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stalks. But now a miracle happened. The prison doors got opened. And he came out wanting to kill himself, thinking that the prisoners had left. Paul the apostle cried out, Don't kill yourself, we're all here. Then he said, I need what you have got. I know why they threw you into the prison. They told me you were preaching the word of salvation. And they didn't like it. And they beat you with many stripes. And you are bleeding in your body. And when they gave me charge, I treated you like prisoners, and I threw you into the inner prison. What shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. How do we know he was saved? In verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. He washed their stripes. Restitution. I am sorry for the part I took in your suffering. You are servants of God. You are men of God. And when those people beat you, and you are bleeding, I will not even have anybody to take care of you. And I threw you into the inner prison. Now I am saved. How do we know that he was saved? He took them the same hour of the night. And then he said, I am sorry for my contribution to your suffering. 
and eternally washed their wounds, he washed their stripes. You tell me you are born again. And after so many months and so many years, no restitution. No change of life. And the wickedness that was there before, and the oppression. You were oppressing your wife before you were born again. And you are still oppressing your wife. And they had talk and they had speech against your wife, you still have. And you were beating your wife before, you're still beating your wife today. And you tell me you are born again, that's not salvation. When this man got saved, the evidence was very clear. He became nice, he became gentle, he became kind, he became compassionate, he became tender, and that same very night, he washed their wounds. And he was baptized, and he, and all is straightway, in verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, do you understand that he was treating them as prisoners before? And now, the evidence of the salvation, they were born again. They had, they had a change of life. He brought them to his house and set meat before them. He set meat before them. Before this time, he gave them prisoners' food. He eat that. And he just threw the food on the ground for them. Because their legs were bound for stalls. But now this man, because he was not really born again, he removed the stalks out of their feet. If he didn't remove the stalks, the chain that bound them, how will he be able to remove them and take them to his house? He removed all that he used in binding them. Before you said they were born again, you bound somebody. You tied off somebody. And you said, I will deal with you. After you tell us you are born again, you are still dealing with them. What you said, the threat you gave out before you were born again, you are still carrying out that threat after you say you are born again. That's not being born again when you are born again. The threat that you gave before, you say no more. The binding, the pressure, the oppression, you had on the lives of people before, you say no more because you are born again. Salvation has evidence. Salvation has practical witness. And then we are told, he rejoiced believing in God with all his house. He rejoiced. He rejoiced. Because he had salvation, true salvation. I tell you again, salvation will bring real, real joy. And that salvation is available for everyone. And if you will believe on the Lord today, you'll have that real salvation in Jesus' name. In, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, us watch, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. The invitation is coming to you. Salvation is available for you, and I pray you will not reject it. Acts chapter 2 verse 21. Acts chapter 2 verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is available for everyone. You can call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved in Jesus' name. Point number two, the danger of indifference to the great salvation. The danger of indifference to the great salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 again verse 3. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Stop there for a moment. Now when you say salvation, here we say salvation. In the other church, they mention salvation. In the other assembly, they mention salvation. In the other congregation, they mention salvation. 
how do we know which salvation is genuine? The way we know it, we ask ourselves. This kind of salvation that they are talking about in that assembly, in that congregation, in that church, in that denomination, is it the salvation which at the first Christ spoke about? You know, you meet many people and you talk about salvation. And they say, I have salvation. And then there are people, once they say, I have salvation, then say, oh, praise the Lord, go your way, let me go and talk to another. Don't release them yet. What kind of salvation do they have? It's like somebody says, I have a car. Don't say that's all right then. What kind of car? Made where? Made in Taiwan? Or made in Japan? Or made in Germany? Or made in Nigeria? Or made in the village? Which one? If they say they have salvation, ask them, which one? Is it the same kind of salvation that Zacchaeus had? And then he did restitution. Is it the same kind of salvation that that woman had when she was weeping, wiping the tears of the feet of Jesus? Is it the same salvation that Paul the Apostle had that they said the faith he persecuted before is not preaching? Is it the same salvation that makes a person a new creature in Christ? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken of? There are different kinds of what people call salvation. There is a salvation of raising up your hand, and that's all. You keep on smoking, keep on drinking, and keep on committing adultery, and keep on lying, and keep on fighting, but I'm saved, I raise up my hand. That's a different kind of salvation. That one will not take you to heaven. Jesus did not say, raise up your hand. It's okay to tell them, raise up your hand. It's okay to say, come forward, but if that is where it starts, you're not saved. Salvation, the kind of salvation that Jesus gave people, he said, now, I'm giving you that grace, go and sin no more. It's a salvation that changes your life. It's a salvation that transforms you. It's a salvation you'll be able to say, I am now a new creature in Christ. A penny man be in Christ is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It's not the kind of salvation that makes you to know how to serve the devil more. It's the kind of salvation that takes you out of sin, out of the hand of the devil, and gives you a new life in Christ. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken of by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us? By them, unto us, by them that heard him. That's the kind of salvation that Peter preached. Save yourself from this unto a generation. Repent. Go away from sin and be converted. And the Lord will send a time of refreshing upon your life. So great salvation. Acts chapter 13. You see the religious people that reject so great salvation. Acts chapter 13. Verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But see, ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You see these religious people here, Paul began to declare to them, the value, the importance of so great salvation, of the necessity of making up their minds, come to the Lord today, have a change of life, come, be reconciled unto God who wants to save you. And then they put that salvation away from themselves, and they judge themselves unworthy of eternal life, unworthy of everlasting life. They had it, but they rejected. They had it, they put it away. They had it, they said, I am not worried about that now. That's not why I came. I came for another thing. You see, he said, you judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. What a dangerous thing in Ezekiel chapter 33. 
Ezekiel chapter 33, we're looking at it from verse 9. Ezekiel 33 verse 9. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. The evangelist comes to you, as I come to you this morning, and I declare to you the word of salvation. I declare to you the way of escape from the judgment of God. And then you brush it, you brush it off your ear. You take it off your mind. And you look away from it. And you say, not me, not you. I've given you the word. And you see the possibility of salvation. The possibility of coming to the Lord. The possibility of repenting, turning away from your sin. And the possibility of the grace of God coming upon your life and turning you around and totally taking away all the uncleanness, all the unrighteousness, all the evil out of your life. And then you come out from the hand of Christ, a new creature, a new man, a new woman. If you reject it, it says the wicked man will die in a sin. But the evangelist has delivered his own soul, the danger of neglecting salvation, the danger of being indifferent to the word of salvation, to the way of salvation. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 24, Acts 24, reading from verse 24 and verse 25, Acts 24, verse 24, and after certain days, when Felix with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, sent, he sent for Paul, and had him concerning the faith in Christ. This man himself had heard about Paul. In fact, he was an officer. And because he was an officer, Paul was brought to him, and Paul was locked up. For doing no other thing but preaching the gospel, preaching the faith in Christ, preaching salvation through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, let me even hear this man. And then he called his wife. Let's hear the word of God. Let's hear from this Paul. And he brought Paul and he heard him. He had all the apostles concerning the faith in Christ. How to believe in Christ. How to have salvation as a result of believing in Christ. How to have a change of life, a change of destiny as a result of believing in Christ. How to become a child of God, no more a child of the devil, through faith in Christ. He heard him, but then we're told in verse 25, and as he, as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix trembled as he heard the word of the Lord. From Paul the Apostle, the word of the Lord greeted him. The word of the Lord arrested him. The word of the Lord pierced his heart. The word of the Lord brought conviction upon him. He trembled when he heard about righteousness. Paul was emphasizing to him, Felix, you think you're all right, but except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. When Felix heard, he trembled. Church, look up here. It's wonderful to it's wonderful to be a pastor in a church. And when you are a pastor in a church, it's wonderful to have workers, members, leaders everywhere. And it's so wonderful when you have so many coordinators and so many group coordinators and so many overseers and so many people that support the leadership. And it's a wonderful program when you bring these managers directors, governors, governors of banks, and governors of states, and governors and vice chancellors, great men in society, when you bring them together, 
and then we present the gospel to them. Wonderful. What kind of gospel are we presenting to them? If you were to call Paul the Apostle to come and to talk to, that's Felix there, that's Pestos there, that's Agrippa there, and that's Theophilus there. All these great men, you call Paul the Apostle, were having this wonderful and beautiful night. We well, want to declare the gospel to Felix and Festus and, and the Theophilus and Agrippa. Paul, speak to them. After Paul finishes speaking to them, they will not be able to eat. I'm telling you. The kind of problems we're having. I will say we're bringing these highly placed people together and we give them music and we give them food and we give them testimonies and then somebody comes and we say these are highly placed people, don't talk too long, you must tailor the message according to their taste. And then when you talk, don't talk doctrine, don't talk any serious thing, don't talk about polygamy, don't talk about restitution, don't talk about fraud, don't talk about 419, don't talk about stealing government money and enriching their pocket. These are highly placed people who want to win them. That's not gospel. That's not gospel. We're wasting time and we're wasting resources. And if you go back to the word of God, the gospel was not toned down. The gospel was not watered down. The gospel was not modified because they were talking to Felix. It's the same world. It's the same salvation. It's the same Christ. And if anybody will be born again, whether Felix or Zacchaeus, whether Matthew or Theophilus, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. That's the word of God. If we cannot tell the people the word of God, if all we want to do is make them feel at home and make them love our church. Loving the church is one thing. Loving Christ is another thing. Turning away from sin is another thing. When, when uh, Paul the Apostle, when he declared the word of God and he reasoned of righteousness and of temperance and of judgment to come, then he trembled. And when you are preaching like that, preaching the word of God, not all of them are going to accept. In fact, many of them may even neglect. And then, if, let's say you get any of our group coordinators to talk to the people. After talking to them, while he's talking, the people are already feeling inconvenient and some are going out. And then he says, now you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you raise up your hand? Can you stand up? We're going to pray together. And nobody receives up your hand because of the kind of message that that group coordinator preached. Then all the other coordinators will go to him and now, you see, you're spoiled tonight. See the kind of message you gave. Did they respond? Did they raise up their hands? Who's fault? Is it the fault of the person telling the truth? Or the fault of the people that don't want to leave their sin? I went to beg them. I went to deceive them. And just to make them blindfold them to raise up their hands, just to get hands to be raised up. No! We're to preach the word of God. And you preach it in season and out of season. And you reprove and you rebuke. And with all love, suffering and doctrine, we're to preach the word of God everywhere to everyone without fear and without favor. Church, say Amen! amen. That's how Jesus started it. He told Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, he must be born again. We must emphasize the same word of God whosoever we are preaching to. We don't have any right to dilute the message, to tone down the message. If anybody is going to get saved, there is only one way that leads to the kingdom of God and it's a narrow way that leads to the kingdom of God. And the poor people will take that same way. The rich people will take that same way. The professors will take that same way. The highly placed people will take that same way. The government officials, if they are going to get to heaven, they will take that same way. Say Amen. Amen. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24 verse 25 and it's as a reason of righteousness and of temperance and of judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. 
when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He never called again. The sea was too tough for him. But thank God, thank God, there were people of those days, Theophilus, he was an excellent and an highly placed person. He received the word. Even Paul the Apostle himself, he was uh, the most educated, talented of the people at that time. He received the word, and there were people in Caesar's household, they received the word. And some of us who are here, we're not, uh, you know, we're not illiterates, and uh, some of you know, I was a lecturer at the university, at the university before, and especially, uh, uh, you know, an expert in mathematics, I received the Lord. Mathematics does not hinder you from receiving the Lord. Being a professor does not hinder you from receiving the Lord. If you want to get to the kingdom of God, this is the way. And thank God I've taken that way. I said, thank God I've taken that way. And uh, since we started preaching the word of God, I will preach it everywhere. And uh, this year alone, I've been to Germany, I preach it the same way I preach it over here. I've been to Europe, I preach it the same way I preach it here. I've been to the white people, I preach it the same way I preach it here. I've been to the black people, I preach it the same way I preach here. I've been to India this year, I preach it the same way I preach it over here. I preach it in India, and somebody, not a member of our church, had been all through the message, it, it was crying. Highly, highly placed man, an expert in the technology. He was crying, and then he came after the message. He wanted to talk to me. He couldn't talk. He was still crying. And then I held his hand, and we prayed together. Another person from Singapore, he had that same word of God, walking in the embassy in India, and was highly placed person. And when he told me his qualification is something that is so high that almost I've never had it before, but then he came to me with tears. And he had the word of God, surrendered his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. White people are surrendering their lives to Jesus. Hearing the same message. You see here in our local Ajegole, our local Ajege here, we'll not be able to talk the truth to the people of God. We're going to speak the truth. And those who love the Lord, those who want to get saved, you're welcome. Yeah. I said you're welcome. Yeah. Others are coming in. They are not rejecting. They are accepting. You will accept, and you will receive the gospel in Jesus' name. The danger, the danger of indifference to the great salvation. Point number three. I'm now looking at divine intervention through great, through the great Savior. Divine intervention. Divine intervention through the great Savior. I want to tell you that we have a great salvation. And that great salvation is from the great Savior. It is great because it saves you from all your sins. All your sins, whether they are small or they are big. And whatever the sins are, and whether they are known sins or known sins, it saves you from them. Whether they are things that other people know, or things other people do not know, is saves you from sin. A great salvation from a great Savior. And when you give your life to the Lord, when you surrender your life to the Lord, and then He gets involved in your life, and there is divine intervention, it takes hold of your life, and it turns you around. And it shakes everything shakeable out of your life. And then he begins to pour his blessings upon your life. What a great heritage that is. And what a great privilege that is. I pray it will be yours in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 63, I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 63, I'm reading from verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom? With died garments from Bosra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save, that's our Savior. You see, he's coming. And as he comes, and then people look at him, and they looked at his appearance, and they looked at his glory, and they looked at his majesty. And he looked at his power, and then the people began to say, Who is this one that is coming? That he comes from Edom, and his garments dried, died with, died from Bosra. This that is glorious in his apparel. Who is this? Traveling in the greatness of his reign. And then he himself replied, It's me. 
is a savior and is the lord he is said it is i that speak in righteousness mighty to save look at verse 8 in verse 8 for he said surely they are my people children that will not lie so he was their savior children that will not lie he was their savior thank god for salvation i said thank god for salvation I, and the first thing that made me to know i was saved yes i had joy but apart from the joy i came forward apart from coming forward i knelt down apart from kneeling down i prayed to the lord apart from praying to the lord the, the number one thing that made me to know i was really saved before i became saved i was an expert in telling lies and without even thinking at all i trained myself to be able to give you the ready-made answer to any question you ask me and to be alive and if i knew i was doing something and you were trying to catch me even if you met me in that thing like this and you ask me a question i will if you thought i was wrong and i gave you the answer you change your mind immediately i could whatever i told you and you can if you checked up any other place i would have thought where you will check up what other questions you will ask i will think of what i'm saying now and the results in the future and when i wrap everything together there's no way you can untie that thing but when i became born again praise god for salvation i said praise god for salvation my father my father that was very tall any little thing he could beat life out of you and i was afraid of him but even though i was afraid of him i still i still i still got him with my lies we'll be talking together like this in the open that is in the evening and then i'll say daddy this way i'm coming i see if i was going to the toilet then i'll go and search all his pocket and take all his money and keep the things somewhere and then come back to him and then as as was saying then we'll, talk, we'll continue our talk at the first born and if he looked for that thing, there's no way he can trace it to me, never. And then if I, our principal in our secondary school, that man was tall. He was tall. I'm telling you, when he beat anybody, he will beat like a soldier. Because he was a soldier in the Second World War. And yet, with all the sharpness as a soldier of the Second World War, when I deceived him, there's no, there was no way he could find it out. And that was part of my life. But I became born again. Everybody say born again. Born again. I'm it's wonderful to be born again. This thing we call salvation. Salvation is wonderful. And the very, yes, joy of salvation, wonderful. Needing not to pray, wonderful. Crying because of my sin, wonderful. But the most wonderful thing to me, I couldn't tell lies anymore. Never. Never. If, if put your hands together for Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, that's why sometimes that's why I preach the way I preach because it surprises me. When I ask somebody a question and then he gives, he tells me a lie. Uh -uh. You know, somebody who has been an expert, an expert in a business before. It is a business that I've done before. And then you are not, you are not, you are even, you are, you know, you don't even know how to wrap it up very well. And I said, look, even if you are going to tell a lie, you don't even know how to tell that lie very well. And I look at them like this and they say they are born again, born again. Is that being born again? You see, the thing that made me today I was born again, I couldn't tell lies anymore. And then I went to my father, I said, my daddy, you know something? The money that you are looking for, and the other ones you didn't even know you missed, I was the one that took it. And I was ready to pay anything back. And he was so happy that my son, a change has come in your life, you are my firstborn, and this kind of change, my father will never listen to me before that time. I took him to church. Because now he saw the change. My principal, he was an atheist. He taught us not to believe in God. And that man, you know, I told you when I was in school, and if you go out without permission and they catch you, 
he was a military principal. But I will go out whenever I wanted to go out, and even when they take the roll call, they won't discover that I went out. Even when they take the roll call, and then I will come back. You might be standing there, and I come back. When I come back, if I didn't want you to discover me, you will not discover. Not medicine, not anything. It was, I was just bold, and that was, I just perfected that way of living. Bad life. But I became born again. And then I went to my principal. And he didn't believe in God. And I said, principal, you see, you've been calling me one of your best boys, one of your best students. It's now the grace of Jesus. They believe in Jesus, I told him. Whether he believes or not, that's not my, that's not my, but I believe that's the important thing to me. I said, Jesus has changed me. You know this lie I told you, I correct it now. You see this lie I told you, I correct it now. And the things I did that were not right, I corrected everything. And then he said, although I don't believe in God, but I believe what you are saying. And that man, before he died, I came to Lagos, we started deeper life, or at Bagada. One day I was in the office, and then they said, so and so was looking for me, my principal in the secondary school. And then I came out, I saw him. And the man did not believe in God. But he came to me and he said, I came to visit you. And I came to tell you, although I don't believe in all these other preachers, but you, I know you. You develop under me. And I have seen the change in your life. And of all people in this Nigeria that say they are preaching, I know they are looking for money. I believe in what you are doing. You see, that is it. When I was at the university, I already became a Christian born again. And this gospel, standing on this word of God, I said, no way I will ever change. And whatever it will be the cost, I'm going to show that this salvation is a real thing. The professor, head of department, invited us to come and drink and wine in his house. He was a tough man. Everybody knew. If you disagreed with that professor, there's no way you can take certificate out of university. And then I raised up my hand. I said, sir, I don't drink and wine. He was angry. What? When you are born again, there is a change in your life. A total change. And then he said, what? I said, yes, sir. I don't drink. And when he said, why? why? I said, because I am born again. He said, born again? I said, yes. Salvation. Change of life. Total transformation. I started preaching. My classmates were looking at me. The publisher of uh, the punch, uh, uh, you know, newspaper now, he was in the class because we were classmates. The final year together. And he looked at me, others looked at me, saying, what? And so eventually, he began to, you know, discuss more. And he said, this religion will be wiped away from Nigeria. I said, impossible, sir. And uh, when he left, all the other people went to drink. Praise the Lord. All the other people, they went to drink the pan wine. I was the only one in the class that didn't take the pan wine. And he came back to the class. And I still sat down in the class. Because the righteous is as bold as a lion. And eventually, we took that time. And he was still the head of the department. And that same year, I still took first class in mathematics. When when you know the Lord, you stand for the righteousness. God will stand by you. Yeah. And then, we were having IFL program in Unilag. And my head of department too said, this religion will be wiped away from Nigeria. He was at the University of Lagos to come and do a particular mathematical seminar. And he heard I was there. And he sent one of the people to me and said, Tell that uh, Komui, when he finishes, that Professor so-and-so, his professor, is waiting for him here, and then that he will, I should come to him, that even if it is late at night, I should still come. I will finish that IFL program at that time in Unilag, around after 10, 
And to 11, I knocked that his lawyer was waiting for me. And then we sat down. And as we sat down, he said, I remember you. I remember what I said. And you said, it's impossible. And I've been following your life since then. And I've been following what you are doing. Tell me about this Jesus. <laughs> the cause for salvation. And you know somebody was facing serious persecution in their family, in the stage. That's Nigeria here in the stage. And the parents, they wanted to stop that lady's education. And they beat that child, almost wanted to kill the child. And this professor happens to be a member of their family. And the professor called the parents and said, where is this your child going? And they said, deeper life. They said, leave this child. That, that leader of deeper life was my student. I know him. He's totally different from every person in that is preaching religion. He is totally, I know that man is doing the right thing. So leave him. That's how they left that uh, lady. That lady now is a uh, wife of an overseer in deeper life. <laughs> The cause of salvation, so great salvation. Why are you going to have a penny worth salvation when there's a so great salvation? A salvation that changes life. And then there will be divine intervention in your life. I will never exchange this salvation with any other sin. And if you have not got the right sin, the so great salvation, I'm inviting you today. This salvation, you will have this one. And when you have this salvation, it will totally turn around your life in Jesus' name. Rise up and let us have the great salvation. The great salvation. The great salvation. The salvation that changes life. The salvation that transforms our lives. The, transform, the, the salvation that will take lie out of your mouth. The salvation that will take covetousness out of your life. The salvation that will take wickedness, drinking, and smoking. And will take adultery, fornication out of your life. Salvation. Salvation. So great salvation. Talk to the Lord today. I said, Lord, I give myself to you. Lord, I surrender myself to you. How shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If you have the real salvation, it will change your life. It will turn your life around. Once I was blind, now I can see. Once I was a liar, now I am honest. Now, once I was immoral, but now I am clean. Once I was wicked, but now I am gentle and compassionate. Salvation. Salvation. will give you a change of life. You will never be the same again. To turn you around. That thing you call salvation that doesn't change your character, that's no salvation. That thing you call salvation that doesn't change your dressing, that's no salvation. That thing you call salvation that doesn't change your behavior, that's no salvation. That thing that you call salvation that doesn't take covetousness out of your life, immorality out of your life. Anger out of your life, fighting out of your life, that thing you call salvation. That does not take hypocrisy out of your life, that's no salvation. So great salvation will be got to be spoken of by the Lord. Christ is mighty to save, mighty to save, mighty to save. They'll change your language, they'll change your behavior. It'll change your lifestyle. It'll change your attitude. It will change your appearance and dressing. Salvation, real salvation, will bring a total change, a total transformation in your life. Give your life to the Lord, turn away from your sin, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved.